the next uh, talk that we're going to hear this morning is uh, about the economic impact of Finland's geoinformation, uh, presented by Pekka Nurmi. Tere hommikust, Eesti ja Suome kollegit. It's very nice to be here. And most of you know me, but I'm, I'm so Pekka Nurmi. And I used to work for the Geological Survey of Finland for more than 30 years. Maybe 20 years at different chief scientist positions as, as the uh, science director. And, and my own specialty, specialty is related to ore geology, mineral exploration, and, and mineral economics. And today, in, in this short presentation, I will talk about the impact of geoinformation, which is not well understood, at least non in, among non-geological people. And, and the, the point of view here is, is, is the minerals uh, industry, because for two reasons. The impact has been uh, uh, huge for the mineral industry, and, and it's, it's easier to, to, to calculate than it has been studied a bit. So the talk outline, why geological knowledge is needed, geodata and know-how in Finland, uh, mineral sector development in Finland, uh, economic value and impact of geodata and in, uh, information and conclusions. So it's not well understood that, uh, that actually geodata and, and know-how, these are of crucial importance in solving all kinds of global challenges. We just heard what Simon said, you can't. They find the raw materials or produce without geoscience. That's a very important example. And where do we use geological knowledge? Access to mineral resources, sustainable mining, improve the access to better quality underground water resources. Water is a major issue globally a better use of geoenergy potential for heating, cooling, and, and energy storage. Better land use planning, such as for agriculture, urban development, and a reduce environmental degradation. And forecast, prevent, and manage the climate, the impact of climate change and natural hazards. There are other fields as well, but these may be the most important ones. And, and it's not similar in different parts of the world. The, the societies are different, the economics are different, and the geology, most of all, it's different. So the needs for geoinformation vary a lot from country to country. Here is a nice example of the public geoscience value change in mining. This, this comes from a publication from Chile. But anyway, I, I think it's very, very, it, it describes very well what this is all about. So public geoscience, it produces, in addition to data, it produces maps, reports, advice, knowledge. And, and this is typically 100% government financed thing. The next step, what are the immediate outcomes from the point of mining industry? Of course, more exploration, lower cost, less time for dis discoveries, more efficiency, and, and reduced risks. And then the intermediate outcomes may include ore discoveries, lower development costs, increased investments, more production, increased return of investment. And all this we can see, for example, in Finland over the last 
decades or over longer times. And then at the end, the final outcomes comes. Of course, these are economic growth, employment, prosperous communities, resource rents in some countries, and, and, and government revenues. And if you think about the role of the public financing, so it's practically 100% in the start, and it's, let's say, less than a few percent at the end. A few words about GTK. So GTK has done 135 years of geoscience. And, and GTK was founded in 1886 for mapping and exploring Earth resources. Long-term mapping, exploration, and research activities have led to world-class geoinformation and geoscience know-how. And, and probably the, the most direct impact has been the, the ore deposits discovered by GTK, which led, have led to, to, to mining operations. And, and there are more than 20 of these. And in, in, in the uh, bottom of the slide, you can see the major discoveries by GTK, so classic Autokumpu mine chromium mine, the only chromium mine in Europe, the biggest gold mine in, in Europe, the Kittila mine, Talvivara Terra fame, uh, nickel uh, zinc mine, which actually they, they, they start to, it, it will become the largest nickel sulfate producer globally soon and the Kevich and nickel copper mines. And e except for Autokumpu, all the rest of these examples, they are still operating. And if we, we can easily calculate how much metals have been produced from these mines, and, and, and the value of, of, of the metals is, is 32 billion euros. And the remaining in situ metal value of the known resources, the resources will probably increase in many of these mines, is, is about 150 billion euros. So these are really big numbers and primarily based on, on geoscience and, 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 and mapping. Well, I, I will not go in deep depth in GTK. I'm not working there anymore, but, but but I can say that, of course, GTK has changed and will change, and, and Kimo will take care of that <laughs> in the future. But 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 uh, there has been, of course, changes in business environment, or social needs combined with restructured financing, and, and this ha 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 have led to proactive development of GTK mission strategy and business concept over the last few decades, I would say. And, and it means that also the role of GTK in, in, in the mineral business has, has developed, I would say. And th this shows this in, 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 in practice. So this is exploration expenditure in, in, in Finland. And, and in the past, I could have uh, uh, drawn this even from the early 1900s, but uh, this is from 1995. You can see that still the first, the, in the 90s, GTK invested a lot in, in mineral exploration. But nowadays, GTK's role in, in direct mineral exploration is practically non-existent. Although, of course, GTK does still mapping and, and, and promote things. And whereas companies has, have taken the, the key role in, in there. So I know that there's another story uh, or talk today on, on GTK and Geodata. So just shortly, what, what is the Geodata base GTK has? So it contains the, these are probably the main things, so mineral resources, bedrock information, 
geophysics, geochemistry, quaternary geology, marine geology, geoenergy, and peat resources. And, and GTK has uh, very nice internet systems. You can, you can find information there. They have map services, they have libraries, they have sample archives and, and, and collections. And importantly, they have also interface services, so you can use your own GIS or maybe other softwares as well to, to, to select data from the database. And very important is that this is not only GTK data. It, it's a national data archive. And for example, if you think about mineral exploration data, probably half of the data comes from the mining and exploration companies. They, they have to report their results and data for the government. And that, that goes to the, to the uh, national geological database. That, that's very important. Particularly now when GTK is not collecting that much data than, than in, the, in the past. And uh, there are over 130,000 visitors annually in, in, in these data systems. Just uh, a little bit in more detail, but, but, but what is the data from now from exploration and mining industry point of view? GTK has unique air, airborne geophysical data, so, so the whole country has been flown using 200 meter line spacing and 30 to 400, uh, 40 meter terrain clearance. And, and totally there are almost 2 million line kilometers of, of, of data. And it's not only magnetic, there are radiometric and, and electromagnetic data as well. Ground geophysics is a huge database as well. There are 63 million points. Many, most of these come from, or I don't know most, but maybe at least half of these comes from mining companies. Regional gravimetrics, 300,000 points. Reflection seismics, almost 3,000 line kilometers. And petrophysics, 5 million samples. So these are huge numbers and I haven't seen anywhere else in the world. Of course, it has taken several decades to collect, but it has been systematic, which is, which is very important. Then we have, if we go to geochemistry, we have a nationwide tilt geochemical database, which contains over 80,000 samples and the nominal density is one sample per square, four square kilometers. So the, these are till samples. Detailed till geochemistry, but, but exploration companies typically uh, do at the, the areas over 700,000 samples. And, and a nationwide rock geochemical survey, which includes very uh, complete analysis of 50 elements for uh, 6,500 100 samples carefully selected from the main rock types in, in each area. And then Petrock map, Finland has a uh, seamless Petrock map and, and you, it's the, the nominal scale is one to 200,000, but of course in, in many areas it's much more accurate and you can zoom in as, as, as you like. Uh, this uh, database contains almost 700,000 uh, observations done in the field. And, and then we have the Trill Core Archive, 37,000 drill cores, mostly drilled by the exploration companies, but the information and the cores themselves are stored at the GTK premises. And, and age determination, so almost 1,500 
high quality zircon, uranium, lead, H determination. So Finnish bedrock is very well known and understood. And at last, mineral occurrences, so there is information on over 1,000 mineral deposits. So no wonder that, that Finland's uh, geodata has been ranked as, as top globally, the, first, first, the, the best globally over the last, last almost 10 years. And this is based on Fraser's Institute annual study of mining companies. And, and it covers 8,210 uh, companies depending. This, so this is based on the opinions of the management level people of, in these, these companies. But not only the data is important, it's just the starting point. It's very important to understand what the data means, what you can get out of the data. And, and, and it's, it's also important that CTK has been active in, 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 in modeling the data and, and because the, the best expertise is there. And, and there are many users you, who cannot themselves very much make added value for the system. So here are just some examples. So of course, geological models as, as on the top, top right, you can see that's from the Otokumpu area. There is the huge discovery, one of global, uh, global scale discoveries in Lapland, Sakatti copper nickel deposit, simple model here and prospectivity modeling, but, but CTK has been very good in, in developing uh, these, these techniques, so combining all the different data sets and, and, and uh, evaluating the, where the mineral deposits could be. And, and then very important is to understand how the ore deposits are formed and where we can find this where the metals come, come from, how they are transported, why they are precipitated, and so on. Not going into details in, in this presentation. But if you understand that, it's much easier to find new mineral deposits. It's difficult to hit, when you are drilling, to hit the mineral deposit, but you can hit the, the halo somewhere uh, around the deposit. And one important thing is, is, is the scale issue. So you should do these studies from kilometer scale to, to outcrop scale, thin section scale, and down to the nanometer scale with the current high-tech equipment you can do it. I know that Asko will speak about <laughs> mineral, <laughs> minerals in Finland or, or mineral exploration, but I will suggest some, some slides here too, because this, this shows the direct impact of the work, what has been done. So uh, the investments in, in mineral exploration, it has remained high in Finland ob over the years, and, and it's still very high. It's almost 70 million euros per, per, per year and, and this, is, this is, comes mostly from, from, from uh, exploration companies. And, and if there's a comparison to global exploration expenditure, so, so you can see that even the low pressure there, the expenditure has been quite, quite high in Finland during the last few years. And the, this is just shows a snapshot of the current exploration permitting map from Lapland. And, and you can see that, that uh, Lapland, central Lapland, is the, that's, the hottest, uh, that's the hot spot in Finland at the moment. And, and there are 
many companies there are also there's also a new amazing gold discovery in in western part of that uh, area by, by Rupert resources we know that the the gold we have already there 120 thousand kilos of gold but it's growing all the time and it may be become as big as the Kittila discovery. That's just one example. That's why the companies are interested because there is potential. And and then if we, my mining is a, is a booming industry in Finland you can see particularly the, the blue curve there which shows the volume of metal mining, it stays very stable, low level, 5 million tons, and now it's over 30 million tons. And there are about 45 mines in operating in, in Finland, and, and, and you can see here that, that there actually there are only uh, three big mines in, in terms of, of, of tonnage or of ore mined. And then there are, there are a number of smaller mines. There are about 10 metallic mines and the rest of the mines are, are industrial mineral mines. But we are very lucky in Finland that we, we have so diverse a uh, set of, of minerals and, and mines and, and, and many uh, critical metals are under production or will be under production in the coming years. Shortly, one, one impact if we, if we go from to the battery ecosystem, is, which is also based largely on the resources what we have. I'm not going to explain this in detail, but anyway, we have, we have production of battery minerals and a lot of exploration on that advanced battery materials, battery and production technologies, recycling. And, and this battery ecosystem will become a multi-billion business in, in Finland in the coming years. It is already, I don't know what's the size now, maybe one billion or, but it will grow fastly. I'm not explaining this in, in detail, but but you can see that it's not only uh, the mines there, but, but we have a lot of versatile uh, refineries. We have, we have uh, plants for, for active materials for batteries and, 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 and even battery factories. So, so that's, that's one impact which basically starts from the chair data. So you need to follow the, 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 the downstream chains. Okay, there, there are some economic figures also, uh, others what I explained, but the more exact figures on the value of Finnish geodata. Uh, estimated by, by Sabikko and his co-workers. And, and, and they estimated that the cost value of Finnish chair database from the perspective of, of the minerals economy is approximately 1.3 billion euros. It's a lot of money, of course, but it has been spent over the years. But they estimate that uh, 2.4 euro turnover, 1.1 euro value added, and 0 0.50 cents tax revenue have been generated per one euro invested in the acquisition of the geo database. So these are direct impacts, and, and, and sounds really good. The estimated value of Finnish geo database is about 5 billion euros. So it's a, it's a big, big money to the national economy in terms of benefits. And based on avoided costs, the annual social value of the national geo database is, is estimated to 18 million. So geo data is adding value. 
Oh, not going in, in, in detail into this, but, but just where geodata is used. And, and it's not, of course, not only the mining industry. It's, it, there are many other users and, and benefits. And, and uh, I believe that, that there will be also new, new ways to, to, uh, to use geodata, new applications and new data users. This should be studied regularly, ask people what, what they need and try to build the answer for the, them. Uh, there are also studies, scientific studies from, from other areas. These also have been done also from the point of mining, uh, from, from Australia, Queensland, Scott and his, his co-workers conclude that every dollar invested in public geoscience information could have generated something between, let's say, four and six uh, dollars in, in tax revenues. And the in internal rate of return is, is almost 25 percent. In Western Australia, similar kind of study uh, says that the, the Average return to government has been between five to nine, nine times. And lastly, in, in Chile, which is a big mining country, uh, they estimate, or Gildemeister estimates, that one dollar invested, invested could have generated eleven dollars for government as tax revenues. Huge. Okay, coming to the end, some some takeaways from from this presentation. I hope that I could convince you that geodata and geoscientific know-how are of crucial importance in solving global challenges. Needs for information vary considerably from country to country, depending on, on geological environment and the economic structure and, and so, social factors. Uh, based on global benchmarking, Finland is one of the leading countries in terms of, of the availability and coverage of geodata, which have been collected and stored using the best available techniques. Geodata has had a crucial impact on top-level attractiveness of mineral exploration investments in Finland and led to considerable added value in important industrial ecosystems. And at the end, public long-term investment into geodata collection and geoscientific know-how building has shown to be economically feasible and to create huge cross-sectoral benefits for the sustainable development of societies globally. So, I Thank you, Pekka. Um, <clears throat> real quickly, it, um, what's most likely to happen if you uh, if you fund a geologist, they're just going to sink it in a hole somewhere. <laughs> uh, we have time for one or two questions for Pekka. Got to wait for the microphone. Uh, Edward Pukkonen from uh, Est Energia. Tere. Many years ago I worked also at the Geological Survey. So. My question is that you mentioned that uh, this potential metal value uh, in uh, maybe new, new deposits is 150 billion euros. This uh, figure consists all the expenditures related to the mining, processing and so no, on, no, or it, no. is, it is just the uh, value it, of it, metal? It, it, yeah, it, it actually, it, it's, not, it, it's based on, on, on the known resources in these deposits, what GTK has originally discovered, which are still operating. Of course, it's not the net benefit or, or 
it, it can be a figure of, of possible turnover of the business. Yeah. But you but have a very good experience and knowledge about these expenditures and you can calculate well, it. But, uh, it, but it, just it is... Uh, yeah, yeah okay. it depends, of course, from mine to mine. And the other thing is that this, this, these are the current resources. Typically, in big deposits, the, the resources are, uh, are, are increasing over the time, all the time. And, and then it, who can say what this nickel price after 10 years and, mm -hmm. and so on. But it gives some kind of idea of the, of the volume or economic. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Lauri from Geological Survey of Estonia. You mentioned that a huge part of data coming from uh, private companies when they do their exploration. Yes. But depending on the aim of the exploration, the what and how is measured by private companies, the data set I can, can imagine is very different. Uh, how this is uh, structured and kind of integrated in the uh, GTK database or is only kind of part of this data are kind of integrated. Thank you. Yeah, well, there, there are, because the data is not reported to, to GTK directly, it's actually reported to TUCAS, which, which is the uh, mining licensing uh, authority in Finland. They, they have certain rules how, they, how the data should be reported. And, and, and then, of course, GTK staff then put a lot of energy in, in in, in, in putting it into the format that it's, it's, it's usable. And, and uh, you, you, if you have an exploration license area, and, and at the phase when you are, are giving up of the license, the law says that you need to make a report and, and, and deliver also the data for TUCAS. So it's, it's within the mining law, and I, I think that's very important. Okay, thank you very much, Becca. Thanks. There were actually uh, two questions on the Slido uh, that I will go over uh, uh, between uh, talks because I can actually answer them myself. I'm not just a pretty face up here that tells really good jokes. I've been uh, dealing with uh, the processing of, of lanthanides and rare metals, tantalum and niobium, ever since the end of last century when I came to Estonia. First is, uh, it's more of a comment, to ensure a truly green transition, strict mining policies against the use of child labor and unhealthy mining practices must be implemented. Absolutely. Uh, and there are many uh, schemes already in place for such things. If you look at um, uh, tin, tungsten, tantalum, gold mining, uh, there's already many schemes in, in place to ensure that um, uh, uh, what ethics are being used in getting that, that primary resource from the ground. Second one, and I like this. If the amounts of raw materials needed are too big for mining on Earth, would space mining be an answer? Heck yeah! Sign me up. Uh, our next, our next speaker is uh, Enne uh, Juriens from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications, and she'll be uh, talking about the economic impact of Estonia's geological information and future plans. Please. <laughs> 